Shmuel Yitz, what's the deal over here with a two and a half Shmatim? Yeah, that's a very interesting deal they make there with Moshe. So this week, Parashat Matot, we are continuing the story of the battle with Midian. Last year, we discussed this concept of revenge that we find in this week's parasha. As usual, we'll link that video at the end of this one. This year, what I want to talk about is what happens after that war. We find the two and a half Shvatim. We find Reuven, Gad, and Chatzis Shevet of Menashe, and half of the tribe of Menashe, coming to Moshe and requesting to stay on the other side of the Jordan River, not to enter El Tisel, because apparently they had a lot of cattle. Apparently, they needed that pasture. They needed that place. And when I tell you that Moshe gets upset at them for doing that, you would assume that he gets upset. Why? Because they don't want to enter Eretz Yisrael, because they don't want to fulfill that promise that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the promise that has been with them for so many years. They do not want to fulfill that promise of returning back to the land of milk and honey. But actually, when you look in the Pesukim, that's not what bothered Moshe. That's not why Moshe got upset. Moshe got upset because Moshe was worried that by them not wanting to enter Eretz Yisrael, then the rest of Am Yisrael are going to hear that and get worried and also not want to enter Eretz Yisrael and fight the battles that are needed to be fought over there in Eretz Yisrael. That's what bothered Moshe and then they get into this whole agreement of they will go first in war, they will lead into battle and only after Am Yisrael gets all the land of Eretz Yisrael, that's when they can return to their land. And you really have to ask about this. Why is this what's bothering Moshe? Why isn't the greater problem of them not wanting to enter Eretz Zavat Chalab with Rosh? Why is that not the issue with them? Where is that problem? Why is that not mentioned at all? Why isn't Moshe caring about that aspect of this issue? And on top of that, when you look in the Midrashim, you see that they did something wrong, that something in this request is not a good thing. And you really have to ask, so what is so wrong about their request if the fact that they're not entering the land of El Tisrael is not what bothered Moshe? So what is the problem with what they're requesting? What is the big issue with the two and a half Shvatim asking to stay on that side of the Jordan? So what exactly is going on over here with this story of the two and a half Shvatim that end up living on the other side of the Yardin and not entering El Tisrael? Well, I think that obviously the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu is not focused on the fact that they're going to be there is maybe because at the end they're supposed to be there. Maybe this is somewhat hinted with the language Moshe uses when he talks about Eretz Israel that the Miraglim didn't get. This is the land that was promised. And we know that the land that was promised to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov includes the other side of the Jordan River. Meaning at the end, if we're focused on the land that's promised and not on what's supposed to be now, but what's supposed to be later, yes, there is room for you to get this part of the land. And therefore, that's not the problem. The problem is, is that you asking to be in the land now is actually causing everyone else to not continue and do the next step in the process. You're skipping to the end of the process and not going through the process with all of Amisra. But I think to understand what really went wrong here and what Moshe is really bothered by and what Chazal are bothered by and say they're actually punished for, it's in the first word maybe the first letter in this story, the letter Vav, starts by saying that Reuben and God had a lot of cattle, had a lot of possession. But there's the letter Vav. What does the letter Vav have to do with anything? The letter Vav means and they had. And what? And connecting to something before. Before we had a war with Midian. How does this have to do with the war with Midian? But obviously it does. And if we look back at the end of the war of Midian, we see an interesting Parsha that sometimes overlooked. We know the story of Midian and that's the end. They came back, they won the war. But the Torah spends many psukim describing all the possessions that they got from the war in Midian and goes into details of how they have to deal with these possessions and what they need to do and how part of them has to go to the Levim and how some of them donate part of it to the Mikdash. This whole parsha is what happens right before. And somehow what happens here is deeply connected to what happens before. And I think the first reason is where do they have so much cattle from? Obviously the reason they have so much cattle is from before, but wait, they're the only ones with a lot of cattle? So first of all, maybe not. Maybe there are others with a lot, but how could technically they have more than others? We know it was given out, you know, evenly. So why do they have more? Because if we look in the Psukim before, we see that there are some that got more. Those that actually fought got a larger portion than those that didn't fight. Maybe this is already a hint to who Reuven and God are. And maybe this is why Moshe is so worried. We know who you are. You are the main fighters. You lead the war. This is why you have so much. You fought those wars. You got more than everyone else. But if you step down now, you the leading fighters, then look at the impact that's going to have on all of Amisra. But I think that 
that Bob is saying more than that because the story right before this is a fascinating story where we see the leaders in the army, the commanders, come to Moshe and they say something interesting. They say, we counted our people and no one's missing. And they seem to be shocked by this. Surprised, a good surprise. You know, we counted everyone and we knew we won this war, but we didn't know that actually no one was missing. And their response to this, and therefore here is a present. And they bring all this gold to the Mikdash. This isn't what they were requested the Psukim before to bring, the portion that they were supposed to bring of what they got. This is something extra. And maybe this is the contrast to what Bnei Gadu Bnei Ruven is. This is the story where they recognize how everything they got is godly. They look and see this isn't a natural war. There is no natural way that everyone comes back okay. It's a war. We won the war, great, but that everyone is okay, this is godly. Everything is from God. And that recognition causes them to donate what they donate towards the Mikdash. And that's the contrast of the story of Reuven. Because it seems that the real problem with the two and a half Shvatim is how they see wealth, how they treat wealth, their priorities in life. We see actually the Midrash points out another point where when they come to Moshe with their request, they ask to build a place for their cattle and for their kids. But when Moshe responds to them, he says, you're going to build houses for your families and for your cattle, meaning your priorities are totally messed up. And that's the real story here. As we're about to enter Eretz Israel, as you're going to start having your own possessions, your own land, the biggest challenge is how do you treat that? And maybe this is what the Midrash is saying here, because the Midrash Rabbah talks about the fact that there are presents in the world, Chochma, Gvura, and Osher, wealth. And the problem is that they're great, it says, when it's Matnat Shamai. But when it's not, then they're not great. Now, what does that mean? Everything's Matnat Shamai. Everything's coming from Hashem. Is there wealth that's not coming from Hashem? But the Midrash uses an interesting phrase. When it's not from Hashem, meaning that Chotfim, they grab it. Everything is from Hashem. But it's about how you recognize things and how you look at things. And when Hashem tells us we need to go conquer the land, and you say, wait, 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 I have a lot of possessions. I'm not able to go into the land now. I have to take care of my possessions. What? Where did these possessions come from? This is from a war that Hashem just did for you. Hashem helped you conquer this war. He just gave you all those possessions. And you're saying, I can't do what Hashem wants because I have possessions. That's the point that you're grabbing for yourself. That you're not recognizing that everything you have is from Hashem. Everything in this parsha before, I think, is focused on this. It tells us how to treat these possessions. We need to take these possessions and foible them. Here we learn the mitzvah of foibling. When we take possessions from other nations, we need to take them and put them in a mikvah, meaning they're holy. These are regular possessions. These aren't possessions going to the mikdash. But we treat them differently. We need to respect. We need to look at everything we have as a present from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When we look at everything we have as a present from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, all our priorities are set correct. We don't, as the Midrash says, separate ourselves from our brothers because of our possession. Our priorities are set correctly both towards our brothers and also towards our family. We first see our family, we see our brothers, we see what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from us and our possessions are a part of that. They help for that. We don't mess up the way we see things. Very good, very good. I think like you're saying, really the main point over here in the story is the priorities that Am Yisrael has or should have and the priorities that the two and a half Shvatim had. Because as we see with Moshe Rabbeinu, when he turns to them and answers them, he says two things. First of all, he says, this means that your brothers will go to war and you guys will sit here, you guys will stay here. And on top of that, why are you going to cause your brothers not wanting to go into Eretz Yisrael? And you can really see this two ideas, this first concept of disconnecting themselves from Am Yisrael, separating themselves from Am Yisrael as a nation of what Am Yisrael is. And we know that throughout history, this is what led to many, many, many problems. And looking at the context of where we are, this is also what began this whole thing with Midian, with the Chet of Baal Peor, where slowly, slowly Midian tried to slowly take apart Am Yisrael from the inside. And this is what began this whole revenge with Midian, this whole battle with Midian, is this idea of disconnecting parts of Am Yisrael for each other. And this is the number one fear that Moshe Rabbeinu has over here, that if you guys are going to stay here now and they're going to fight for the land that the Gadosh Baruch Hu promised us, you will not be connected to the land. The fact that you will not be fighting hard for the land will make this disconnection within you from Eretz Yisrael and from the people from Am Yisrael that will be there and will automatically from now create this disconnection between the two parts of Am Yisrael. And really we see that, like the Mitra says, this is what later on led to them really being the first ones to go to Galus because this disconnection began already over here because of their priorities not 
not being set straight because again, they would have gotten this land at the end. But the fact that they're asking for it now, that's the problem because they conquered these land. This land will have to be inherited. This land will have to be settled, but not now at the end, like you were saying it after all the process, after the twin Ashra team would fight hard for Eretz Yisrael too. That's when they can go back and get that land, but they wanted it now because their priorities were not set straight. And this is the main problem over here with the two and a half Shvatim. It's not necessarily the fact that they didn't enter the land of Eretz Yisrael. It's the fact that they started making this small rift between Am Yisrael, between the Shvatim and Am Yisrael. They're allowing their possessions to get in between and to create this rift in Am Yisrael. But even though they are going to be the Chalutzim for the war and they do end up fighting first for Am Yisrael, even though, again, like I mentioned, in Sefer Yoshua, after the land is settled and they go back, yet then we are on the brink of a civil war between Am Yisrael because what happens over there? Because that rift has began. That rift has happened already. And you know, looking at what goes on just before the story of the Twin Ash Vatim, like you were saying, the whole battle with Midian and the distribution of the spoils from that battle, it very much reminds of a few other places in the Torah that the Torah goes through a whole list of possessions. But it's also very different from the other places in the Torah. Because on the one hand, we know that when Amisel left Egypt and after Kiyat Yamsuf, we know Amisel had Rechush Gadol, had a lot of possessions. But the Torah doesn't describe to us and doesn't go into detail exactly what Amisel had. However, on the other hand, we do know that in the Mishkan, in Parashat Pekudei, and also later on in the beginning of Sefer Mamidbar, in Parashat Naso, where the Nesi'im brought on the day of inauguration, when they brought the Korbanot, the Torah does go into great detail what exactly was brought, both in Parashat Pekudei, where it mentions all the different summaries of everything, the weight and the value, and also in Parashat Naso, where after every Nasi brings the Torah again, summarizes everything together and brings a whole list of what was gathered all together. Yet over here, it's very different because over here, this is probably the most materialistic place because this has nothing to do with the Mishkan. The list over here is a 100% materialistic list of what the fighters, what the warriors managed to conquer from the battle. This is not something that was taken in order to give to the Mishkan or to give to a holy purpose. This is something that was collected in war. And maybe this is the main message that the Torah is again teaching us over here, that now that they're about to enter the land of Eretz Yisrael, the more materialistic place, again, not the land of the miracles of the Midbar, where everything was miracle all around them, where they had holiness all around them 24-7, but rather a place where they will have to work hard for their belongings, a place where Enei Hashem Elokei Chaba, HaKadosh Baruch looks at the land and blesses our work, but still people have to work hard for what they earn, but the Torah still says to us over here that even in a place like this, even in a world like this, it's not 100% materialistic, meaning even when you have all these possessions, you could turn them into holiness, you can use them in order to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch like you were saying, first of all, with the mikvah, second of all, with the truma and the ma'asel that is brought over here, and third of all, maybe most importantly, is the priorities that you have, the priorities that the two and a half Shema team had. Is the priority, the wealth, is the reason they're doing this, staying on the other side of the Jordan because of the possessions, because it's a more materialistic place, or is the reason they're doing it because Lashem Shemaim, because it's a matnat Shemaim, like the Midrash says, because they understand that everything they got is from HaKadosh Baruch like you were saying, at the end of the battle, they understand understand that this is one great miracle. And that's the big question over here. And this is maybe what bothers Moshe Rabbeinu the most and what's actually going on behind the scene over here. The priorities that the two and a half team had, the wrong priorities that they had, like the Midrash says, that because of their priorities, this is what led on later on to them being the first ones to go to Galus, being the first ones to get disconnected from Amisel, to do idol worshiping, and so on and so on. You know, it's very interesting. Maybe this finally explains the last two psukim that always bothered me at the end of this parsh. It's this description of Yair going and conquering a place, and it tells us he conquered the place, and he calls it Chabot Yair, and then Novach who also goes and conquers it and calls the place Novach. What is this? How does this have to do with anything? You know, there were a lot of places that were conquered. There's many stories. There's many cities that they built. Why is this important for our story? But based on what we're saying now, it's very interesting. They conquer conquer the place and what do they call it? Me. They call it by their name. And as the Pasuk says, Novach calls the city Novach Bishmo. He calls the city Novach in his name. Right? So this is exactly what we're saying. Ruven and Gad and Chatsi Shevet Amenashe, the problem is their priorities. The problem is how they see the things that they conquer. 
and going into Eretz Yisrael, this is the most important thing that we can't do. We can't see what we conquer and what we achieve as ours, as me, as things that have to be named after me. That is the message that the Torah is trying to teach us here. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu detects in their words, and this is what he's so worried about. Just before Am Yisrael is about to conquer a whole land, and every single one of them will have many possessions, and will feel that they worked hard for achieving what they achieved. That's that riskiest point where you can suddenly get so much, lose your priorities, and we'll see all of Sefer Dvarim is filled with Moshe trying to remind them to set those priorities, to not get confused by these possessions, as we'll see later on in Sefer Dvarim. Exactly. It's all about the priorities that the two and a half Shvatim had and the priorities we should have in our own lives. The order of our priorities, the order of things we do, the attention we put into our wealth. What are our priorities regarding those? That's the message the Torah is trying to give over over here, but we're out of time as usual, so we'll end here. I'll just remind our viewers again what we discussed the last two years. Last year, we discussed the whole concept of revenge. How come the last mission Moshe Rabbeinu has is to revenge the Midianim? And even more so, the idea that Moshe himself was saved by the Midianim when he ran away from Paro. So how come he has to revenge them? We'll leave that video at the end of this one. Also, as usual, if you enjoyed this video, feel free to share it. Like the video below, comment on our YouTube channel. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing and Shkoyach Yitzi. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and I'm going to share with talk again next week.